A superstorm whacks the Jersey Shore. You walk in, what do you find? You couldn't even get through the front door. I mean, it was overwhelming, the damage that had been done. A town institution obliterated. But could a strange inheritance of superheroes save the day? I was holding the books up, and I was screaming like a little giddy schoolgirl. <laughs> He had comic books from the 1940s during the war period, like a Superman 17 with Superman beating the snot out of Hitler. I'm Jamie Colby, and today I'm driving along the Jersey Shore on a sliver of Barrier Island that took a beating from Superstorm Sandy in 2012. I'm here to meet a family rebuilding from the disaster, and their strange inheritance may end up being their lifesaver. I'm Rick Wenzel. Our family business has been here in Lavalette, New Jersey for generations. I found something in the attic that's going to help us save our business. The Wenzel family is a fixture in this tiny beach community. They're best known for an old ice cream shop and restaurant called Salty's that, like so much of the Jersey Shore, got pummeled by Sandy. Now, Salty's was not your average neighborhood ice cream parlor. We were the largest bulk ice cream distributor for Hershey's ice cream. Every year, they would come and give us a golden scoop you're talking 200,000 gallons of ice cream every summer. What was the traffic like here on a good day, summertime? Salty's was the place to come. There would be a line out the door, sometimes even around the block. It was a nice spot for an evening out. It could be music, it could be hermit crab races. It was always a surprise. Why is it important that Salty's come back? It's a really an anchor for our whole community and the people who come to the Jersey Shore. The story of Salty's and this strange inheritance begins far from the boardwalk with Brick's grandfather, Gustav Wenzel. An enterprising German immigrant, he opens a bowling alley during the Great Depression in Garwood, New Jersey. Gustav also sells comic books. He may have been his own best customer. He was an avid comic book collector. It was all different genres. It wasn't just science fiction, or it just wasn't superheroes. There were Western comic books. There were comic books about baseball players. Gustav's son, Bob, inherits his dad's love of comic books. Bob's favorite chronicles the adventures of a space explorer he will name his son after. My father's favorite cartoon character was named Brick. And uh, here's a picture of one. Hmm, Brick Bradford. Yeah, I see it. <laughs> the rosy cheeks. In 1962, Bob Wenzel moves to the beach and opens Salty's Gifts in Lavalette. Over the years, Salty's evolves into an ice cream shop and restaurant. As a boy, Brick puts in his time at Salty's, but he's determined to strike out on his own. By the time I was 14 years of age, I had started my own bait company. I uh, had a passion for it that just continued to grow. The commercial fishing industry was extremely profitable. It's my first fishery experience. Okay, what are well, we going to do? Uh, we're going to put you right to work. Wait, you want me to wear these? Uh, yes, ma'am. I recommend it. You do? Yes, I uh, do. Okay, well, orange is the new black. While I do a wardrobe change, let's keep the blue fish on ice and bring Britta into this boardwalk empire. It's a stormy day in 1997. It was blowing northeast, 20, 30 miles an hour, wind blowing and rain. A childhood friend notices Brick's fishing boat has come loose from the dock. I was waitressing in a restaurant and I tied it back up. But it, it wasn't just tied up, it was tied up perfectly. Not everyone knows how to tie up a boat properly, especially during a major northeaster. We looked at each other like, you know, my goodness. That's you, all grown up, you know, because we had known each other since childhood. One impressive nautical knot, and next thing you know, Brick and Britta tied the proverbial one. In 1997, when Brick's dad retires, he hands the business down to the kids. During the summer, the restaurant does real well. 
And then when there's no tourists around, the fishing income is what kept us going. Okay, cue the girl and the waiters. All right, Brick, now that I got all suited up, what am I going to do? All right, Jamie, we got these bluefish here, and we're going to have them come down and go into 100-pound totes and get them ready to be shipped out. Ooh, they weigh almost 100 pounds, and this guy's <laughs> waving like at that. me. Oh, yep. you got to turn around too, buddy. Yep, you got to get them swimming downstream as they go through. Okay, I'm yep. straightening them out. Yep. Straighten them out. Oh, you mind getting that one? Oh, look at the size of this go. one. Got to swim the right way. You don't get to go to the finer restaurants. Okay, bye. See you. Okay, so now we got to put them in the box over here. Come on. Oh, That's a big one. Wow. <laughs> Whoa. These will be on their way to New York in an hour. I have to make a reservation. I still have time. <laughs> Lid. 100 pounds. Yep. Blue fish. Brick tells me each box like this will sell for 80 bucks. And today's total catch is worth about $2,800. All right. Good day's work. Thanks, Brick. No, thank you. I'll see you later. All right. I'll see care. you later. <laughs> There's a saying I have. Fishermen are always starving, but they eat well. Brick and Britta want a safety net. A way to turn the family's seasonal businesses into an enterprise with year-round cash flow. Real estate in this beach community is always a good bet. So they purchase new properties and renovate the family's old ones. When Brick's grandmother dies, they remodel her house as well. After my grandmother passed away, we had to demolish the building. Well, when we took out one of the walls, there were comic books stuffed into the walls, just like insulation. We had a feeling they were worth something, but we really didn't know much about it because I'm not a comic book collector. So they just put the comics away and don't think about them much. They move on to other business ventures. Along the way, they really roll the dice. We dropped insurance that we had carried in the properties. And it was because the insurance premiums had gotten so high. We were looking at over $30,000 in insurance annually. So we decided to take that money, invest it, some in the stock market, some in other pieces of property. A decade and a half go by, and their gamble seems to be paying off. Then in the fall of 2012, the Wenzels prepare to celebrate Salty's five decades on the Jersey Shore. This is real popular during the summer. Hermit crabs. As they do on October 22nd, a tropical storm in the Caribbean becomes Hurricane Sandy, and the Jersey Shore is in its crosshairs. We've seen what happens when a storm hits the Jersey Shore, but it was the first time we ever saw a storm of this magnitude. That's next. But first, our strange inheritance quiz question. Which Jersey artist has the most number one hit singles? Bruce Springsteen, Frank Sinatra, or Whitney Houston? The answer in a moment. So which Jersey artist has the most number one hit singles? It's C, Whitney Houston, who hit the Billboard number one single spot 11 times. October 2012. Brick and Britta Wenzel are planning a celebration for Salties, the Jersey Shore ice cream parlor that's been in Brick's family for half a century. Then they turn on the news. This morning I formally declared a state of emergency. Uh, in anticipation of Hurricane Sandy. The Wenzels board up Salties and their other businesses and get off the island. Sandy is the Jersey Shore's perfect storm. It hits at high tide, amplified by a full moon. We're one block in off the beach, and there are literally waves of water rushing down Washington Avenue, across Ocean Avenue. You really can't drive on these streets right now. Two weeks later, Brick and Britta return home, but nothing can prepare them for what they're about to see. It was overwhelming emotionally to just absorb the damage that had been done. The roadway itself had big holes in it and telephone poles down. And then at Salty's, uh, all the ice cream cases were all flipped, all the display cases in the gift shop, which is a giant pile of broken glass. 
For the last 15 years, Brick and Britta have gone without flood insurance. Now, their luck's run out. They estimate that rebuilding their home, Salties, and their other businesses will run seven figures. They scramble for loans and soon learn there's no quick fix and lots of red tape. This is paperwork from just one project. This is one building that we are working on. So all of this just to get one of your properties in order? Yes. We needed cash right away, at least to start demolition. The longer the water sat in the pipes, the worse it got. After the storm, cash was king around here because people would not work for anything but cash. So we started slowly working our way through the family's belongings hey, come on, I need your help. and liquidating what we can. As Brick is rummaging through the house looking for anything that could be sold, he stumbles across that old stash of comic books, the one that goes all the way back to his grandpa Gustav. One of the things that my grandfather left for my father, which my father left for me, was comic books. We had them up in the attic. How many comic books are we talking about? That's next on Strange Inheritance. Here's another quiz question for you. Which was the first comic book hero to get his own movies? Was it Superman, Captain Marvel, Batman, or Captain America? The answer in a moment. So, which was the first comic book hero to get his own movies? It's B. The Captain Marvel Saturday movie serials launched in 1941. He was followed to the silver screen by Batman, Captain America, and Superman. In 2013, Brick and Britta Wenzel are scrambling for cash to rebuild their family enterprise after Superstorm Sandy. That includes Salty's, the Jersey Shore ice cream parlor that's been in Brick's family for half a century. As they do, Brick rediscovers a long forgotten collection of vintage comic books, a strange inheritance going back to his grandpa Gustav that may be a treasure trove. We had him up in the attic. The attic, yes. where there wasn't water? Correct. How many comic books are we talking about? Well, it turned out we had over 1,100 comic books. That's amazing. Thank goodness they'd been stashed in the attic anywhere else, and Sandy would have washed them away. What's more, Brick realizes Grandpa Gustav kept his comics in pristine shape. They weren't fingered through. There weren't a lot of bent pages. It was set aside and someday they might be worth something. And possibly the gold mine Brick has been searching for. He scours a guide on comic book values. I took the very first comic book out and I looked it up and it said $1,200 and I screamed. And then I took the next one and that one was 2,000 and 3,000 and 4,000. And I was screaming like a little giddy schoolgirl. <laughs> Brick researches further and learns that the biggest places to deal comics are comic conventions, like Comic-Con and the Big Apple, where fans dress up, celebrities sign autographs, and where buying and selling comic books is big business. You can imagine people walking around in costumes. That's not my thing. I'd rather be wearing rubber slickers. So in March 2013, the Jersey Shore fisherman cast his net at a closer by comic book expo in Asbury Park, New Jersey, where one conventioneer catches his eye. This one young man in a really sharp style suit was making out a check. And I went over and took a peek and it was for a million dollars. Are you exaggerating here no. with a million? No. And you're like, hello. Once I saw that, I said, that's who we want to go speak with. The big shot broker is this guy, Vincent Zerzolo, co-owner of Metropolis Collectibles in Manhattan. Time for me to head downtown for a little visit. Wow. Vincent, this is unbelievable. You must be a kid in a candy store every day at work. Every day I'm the happiest kid in the world. Couldn't get any better than this. Or much more lucrative. My company purchased what is now the world's most expensive comic book for $3.2 million. 
Action Comics number one is the holy grail of comic books. It's the first appearance of Superman. Superman, let me see what he looked like at oh. the beginning. Vincent sold the most expensive comic book in history. So they were the ones with the jingle, and that's who we wanted to go ring. When Vincent sees a sample of Brick's collection, he's definitely intrigued. What was great about Brick's collection was he had comic books from the 1940s during the war period, like a Superman 17 with Superman beating the snot out of Hitler. And what happens when you break the news to your new best friend, Vincent, that you have a thousand more? You can tell on his expression that he, he didn't believe we had them. And we actually had more than what we thought. We had, a, I think it was closer to 1,200 altogether. Vincent just has to go to Lavalette to see the whole collection with his own eyes. Worth the trip? Definitely worth the trip. The breadth of the collection was really astounding. It wasn't just the typical superhero collection. They had horror, war, and romance as well. Okay, here's why I love comics. Cover, romance, back, pimples disappear before your eyes. <laughs> How do I know when a comic is valuable? There's a variety of different things that go into the value of a comic book. First of all, the most important ones are usually first appearances of characters like Superman or Batman, Spider-Man. Then there's the condition, which plays a really integral part in trying to figure out the value of a specific comic book. You're looking for an accumulation of defects on the comic book. Whichever one has more defects is the lower grade, 10 being the best, 1 being the worst. You're looking for creases, bends, tears, things of that nature. You're not going to test me on this, are I'm going to test you a little bit. Vincent hands me a comic book and asks me to smell it. Tell me what you smell there. Okay. Ocean? Mm. That's actually really good. Um, that comic book was stored in a collection that was uh, by the sea. When you smell something, it takes you back to a time in your life. These types of things, these subtle nuances can really affect somebody. And then you go, bang, I want that comic book. Brick's strange inheritance was stored down by the sea, too, and marinated for decades in whatever sweet scents wafted up into Brick and Britta's attic. Waffle cones, hot fudge, vanilla malteds, that would take me back. So in the end, did your superhero comics save the super day? That's next. Now, back to Strange Inheritance. Superstorm Sandy thrashes the Jersey Shore in October 2012. Three years later, Salty's Ice Cream Parlor, a 50-year-old Lavalette icon owned by Brick and Britta Wenzel, remains out of commission. It's been hard for Brick and I to look out the window and see little kids who just run up the block and get here and realize we're not open yet. But it takes a lot of time and money. We decided to open the gift shop and mark everything down. I mean, basically everything is on the table. But in the spring of 2013, they're really pinning their hopes on 1,200 comics Rick inherited from his father. He discovered them in his attic after the storm and turns to an eager Vincent Zerzolo to auction them off. When you have those different genres and there's so many different flavors, you're gonna have everybody feasting on this collection. Brick and Britta don't expect to get nearly enough to fix all Sandy's damage, but they're hoping for enough to tide them over. Getting rich wasn't in the equation. It was about trying to recover from the storm. In May 2013, seven months after Sandy, Vincent opens online bidding for Brick's comics on his website, Comic Connect. We start our auctions at $1 start prices with no reserve. All told, they sell over a thousand comic books, but lots of them go for just 10, 20, 30 bucks. Then some go for more, a lot more. Like Superman number 15, it fetches $850. A Marvel mystery sells for more than 1,200. Archie and Jughead, 1,300. A Batman number three, 2,000. A supernatural thriller named Venus, 2,250. And finally, the Superman clobbering Hitler socks him for 3,000 bucks. How did Brick and Britta do? We uh, were able to outperform our pre-auction estimates by about 50%. Total haul for the collection, $300,000. So in the end, did your superhero comics save the super day? 
it was seed money for the process of rebuilding from Sandy. I was inspired by Brick and Britta and this small town's determination to rebuild from Sandy. Before I left, I did my part to help bring Salties back to life. Okay, bring it on. What else you got? Wow. Do we get a lunch break? <laughs> a year after my visit, Rick said he found another box of Grandpa's comics and planned to auction those, too. But despite all the effort, Salty's has never reopened. Yes, superheroes only get you so far. There's one heirloom from his grandfather that Brick didn't sell. These scrapbooks of vintage comic strips dedicated to Brick's father before he was born. Some of the strips are nearly 100 years old. Brick doesn't know how much they're worth, but given the growing market for comics, Brick says he may hold on to them for another rainy day or just keep them as a memory of the grandfather whose comic collection came to the family's rescue. I'm Jamie Colby for Strange Inheritance. Thanks so much for watching. And remember, you can't take it with you.